I believe that that is the announcements that I have. So um, we are very fortunate today, uh, and I'm really excited about this um, because I did a lot of research, as, as most of you know, on the uh, exhibit that uh, we have put up for the uh, 60th anniversary of the Historical Society, and one of the largest things in the history of the Historical Society was the acquisition of this building and the uh, renovation of the building that was done to make it more adaptable to the needs of the Historical Society. So I, I, I saw a lot of pictures, looked at lots of documents uh, in, in doing that research, and I got really, really excited about the work that had been done and the folks that had done the work. And one of the people that was responsible mainly for this renovation is with us here today. Um, and that, of course, is, is Dwight Dibble. And uh, Dwight tells me that, to my surprise, he is, is not a Clinton native. Uh, I thought that he was one of, I mean, myself being a newbie, I think everybody's a Clinton native, but uh, Dwight says that he moved here in the 1970s, uh, and he started his own business here at Clinton in the 1980s, and he's never looked back. And um, we know how busy Dwight is because it's very hard to get in touch with Dwight sometimes. So we know he is, is very busy and has a great reputation, uh, and his reputation, we can tell, is well earned by the way this building looks and how well it has stood the test of time because it's been 21 years this year uh, since the grand opening of, of this building. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dwight Dibble to talk to us about the renovation of this building. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's certainly an honor and a pleasure to be asked to do this. Uh, kind of wonder how life took 20 years for the people to ask. <laughs> It was 
Joe, Bob, and, and Larry, and, and all these guys had to unload everything by hand. They stacked every stone by hand. And how did that stone get there? Local quarries. I wish I knew more about, I, I could tell you where the stones, what quarries they came from. But I can assure you it was not an easy task getting them here and then stacking them up. So one of the things that I also wanted to, to relate is the people that I worked with back then in the original building uh, one of the things that I wanted to do today was there, are, as I said, some of my I don't see here today. I was hoping I would see some more of these. But I don't want to forget as we memorialize the 9-11, there's an individual here who I'm sure would be here today if he could. So I'd like to dedicate everything I say in this program today to Dave Burns. Dave Burns is struggling right now. I'm not sure where he is. But I just hope that everybody kind of keeps him in your thoughts and your prayers over the next few days. Because it was people like him that would come and visit this almost every day and watch our progress. So again, it's not the bricks and the mortar and the stone. Because that's all those elements are until we put faces and personalities into the building. That's what this is really all about. And that's what history really is all about, is not forgetting these people. Because one of the things that we've learned about, I remember in Boy Scouts, I, I thought, when would we ever use this kind of thinking? And we were taught, if you ever get lost in the woods, you have a three-point system to help you, instead of just wandering around in circles, go in a straight line and get yourself out of the woods. Past, present, and future. How can we design a good future if we don't know where we came from? If we forget all of this. So that's the three-point system. We got the past, we got the present, and then hopefully that'll help us guide us to the future. Everything in between we should forget. So, have some information about this place. Hopefully, it will, will be interesting to you folks. Um, it was built in 1832, I guess is when they finally got enough funding and, and things like that to start building the place. I believe, and by the way, during anything I say, if anybody's got anything to add, please throw your hand up, because I had minimal time for research. So if you got something to add, please don't be ashamed to put your hand up. But that's probably the best picture that we have of the, we'll call it, the second phase of this building. In my research, I also found out that in the 30s, when they first started this, it, I think it had, and I, I, all I can tell is from how this was constructed and some of the wording that was in the research. And from the 30s to the 60s, there was, a, there was a time period where the church was going along, my guess is. And then they came up with enough money to, in the 1860s, to put on a different facade. It said in the literature that the front was built out a couple of extra feet. And I think that was at that time when they added the, the squarish looking facade with the steeple and the bell tower and the steeple on top. My guess is that they formed the congregation in the 1860s and then they went a 30 year or so period of probably growth, really good growth. And then they were able to continue with the building. Now the building is of what they call Italianate architecture. And that's got a lot to do with the interior moldings and trim and the centerpiece that we have here. And I'm going to get back to those that in a little bit. But they call it an Italianate architecture. You'll notice that the building is, 
is a rectangle. One of the things I've noticed over the years of working on several of the buildings in town here, the Stone Church, uh, Episcopal Church, uh, a couple of the other churches in our area, I noticed one thing, that the Protestant churches, the far more Protestant churches, seem to have just a very simple square architecture. Whereas the more Catholic churches, the Roman and Episcopal churches, their footprint is almost always a cross. So that part of that way of looking at it is also how the church presents itself in its architecture. In other words, we take a look at St. Mary's and we see the big steeples and, and all the, the fancy things like this. Then we see a church like this that no less beautiful, but far more simple. So a lot of the, the, the architecture that we see here also is a carryover from Europe. One of the things I learned when we put a steeple on a church way down in Pennsylvania, I was hired to put one up down there, it was an interesting one. It was a, a fiberglass steeple. They took a funeral home and they converted it into a church and they put one of these fiberglass steeples on it. So they asked me to go down there and install that and talk about it. And in my research, steeples were a very practical thing. It was a carryover again from architecture from Europe. In the early, early years of the church, back when People didn't have wristwatches. We didn't have cell phones. Nobody had any of that. And the, the church would be existing, and quite often the bell tower would be separate from the church. Or, in a way, attached. It, it, they were all a little bit different. But there was a reason for the bell tower was to call the town to prayer. People didn't have stopwatches. So, when it's time to go to church, ding, 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 everybody rings the bell. So, as time progressed, the, the towers of the bells were really needed protection. So, they started putting roofs on. Well, everybody knows how church congregations can be kind of rough on each other. They, one denomination is critical of one, that one is critical of the other, we don't agree with this, we don't agree with that. So as these churches evolved in these communities, one way of the church body saying that our prayers are just as effective or more effective is because we can afford a big steeple. Okay? We, we're, 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 we're taking in enough money, we're growing enough, we can afford a big steeple. So this is, again, throughout Europe and throughout America, too, this kind of said, hey, we're doing the right thing. Well, at a period of time, the steeples start to deteriorate. And who wants to go climb all the way up there and find out how much time you have left on your roof? So we can look at Clinton as a great example of this. Because if somebody didn't go up there and check on that, then it started to deteriorate and go away. So all of a sudden, that, that, that steeple is starting to, uh-oh, we got problems now. And now it's not just on the, the smaller churches like this. Most people know there's pictures around here too that are fascinating. If you take a look at the stone church right now, that's approximately 70 feet to the top of it. I measured it myself. <laughs> if you can imagine another 60 feet of spire made of stone on top of that, that's amazing. Well, things started to happen. Things started to move and they realized it's going to be cheaper to tear it down than to just fix it and maintain it. So in our town here, I think the remaining steeples are a former Methodist church. Somebody just told me they spent $320,000 up to now 
to maintain that one. We got St. Mary's, <coughs> and I think that's pretty much it for Steeple's Latin County. Church of Annunciation. Church of Annunciation and uh, Clark, Clark Mills. Mills. Clark Mills, do they still have theirs? Yes. Okay. Well, somebody's <laughs> been checking on it then and maintaining it because the wind shear on a steeple is incredible. If you if that isn't bolted down there and down there tight, that thing is going to come over. And I'm sure somebody noticed it, or pieces of it started falling, and that's time to take it down. It's going to be cheaper to do that than it is to maintain it. So, steeple at one point, my guess is shortly after the 1860 renovation, because that would have meant about 60 years of steeple that was removed and. Now it looks very much the same as it does in that picture without the steeple. It's just a flat roof on the top. So when I got here, um, first thing we did was start the painting of the project. And it's, it's a clapboard over uh, post and beam type construction. If you can imagine, you know, post and beam, some guys sitting up in the corner up there. And again, I want to relate this to the people, people that worked here, how hard it was to build this place. So all this material after it had been brought here by horse and carriage and, and, and manpower, muscle, now we're building this place. The timbers here were sawn timbers, most of them. Some of them you can see where they flatten them with the ads. A D X. I, I'm not sure how that's spelled. What is it? ADZ, thank you. So everything was all hand squared up, things like that. Notched where everything, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to grab the water over here. Notched where all the joints come together, and wood pegged. Everything is like this. The reason why this is an open, wide open, and no columns in here, where you see other churches, big buildings have columns. Um, and we think that trust technology is something new, but it's not. They were doing this back then. This is very similar to today's trusses with a, with a, a bottom cord across, lap joints in, throughout, throughout it, and then a triangulated system like this. It's kind of like a bridge. It's kind of like a bridge with a, with a big peak going like this. And that's why it's held up so good. That they, they did a good job. When you go back and look at some of the workmanship that they did with this big timber, it's hard enough for us to keep accurate with today's tools and today's technology. But you look at some of these giant timbers, they're within a quarter of an inch. They're so close, they're so tight. Same thing over at Stone Church. Theirs is like a great big elongated bridge that spans from the back to the front. You can't slip up a table knife in any of those joints. They're still tight. That is going nowhere. So that's the type of construction that the perimeter was out made out of. I think I'm going to drop down to the basement from here. Because when we build, we build from the bottom up. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a background as far as the architecture and why the building is shaped the way it is. So let's drop down into the basement. Um, I believe he has a picture of the basement there for us. Let's start with that one. That's a good, pretty ugly picture, isn't it? <laughs> well, that was after we did all the demo and we took all the, the debris out of there and all the old walls and things like that. So we, we guard, the first thing we did, like back, we back up a little bit, the first thing we did was, was paint place, we replaced a lot of clapboards and did things like that. At that same time, there was a couple of, they were good friends of mine, um, did the roofing for us and did a fabulous job on the roofing. So we got the whole place watertight. That was the first thing that you always do with a renovation like this. Make sure you don't have any more water coming in. The water that leaks around the bell tower is what destroyed all those ceilings and things around that area in the loft. We're going to get back to the loft in a minute. 
Remember we started the basement and so all these guys brought all this stonework and everything like that and they, they started the foundation. Now, one of the things that we learned throughout historical renovation was that they used a different type of mortar prior to the 20s, 1920s. And it, this is a real important point because there are several buildings in central New York. I know there's one in Colgate. There's our own stone church over here that fell victim. And also, it was recorded in some of the research that I did the other day that this building had had some of this work done to it also. But when the 1920s rolled around, building technology changed because they started to add a third element into the mortar of the joints of all these stones that we see here. Prior to, the, prior to the 20s, it was basically the same mix that they built the Egyptian pyramids with. It's a mixture of sand and lime. Very, very little variation of that. So what happened after the 20s and 1920s, people saw erosion on their, on their masonry, stone church in particular. They would use the new mortar to repoint all the masonry. Well, that caused problems. What that does is it traps the moisture that would normally be more or less breathing in and out, passing through, and it creates excessive mortar in the joints of the masonry. So now that mortar is trapped in there and it freezes. And it freezes and thaws, freezes and thaws, freezes and thaws. Next thing you know, stones are popping out. Things are happening, the foundation's moving. Literally over here, we started climbing up to check on the uppermost bell tower. I reached up and grabbed one of the stones to climb, and it came off and it fell down. We then realized we had problems, we had to So whenever we do renovation now, we use the correct formula, which is, for anybody's information, it's nine parts sand, seven parts lime, and one part Portland cement. Very little cement to make it out. That moisture can make its way out. Well, during some time of process in the, the history of this church, it had a different floor level in the basement. The first floor that was installed here, not sure when it came out, but it was wood. It was a tummy groove pine floor over what we would call these days sleepers. Basically, floor joists buried in the dirt all down through there. So when we came, the new the concrete had already been poured. So that most of it, there was only traces of it in these areas back here. But the concrete had been poured. At the time, they had also dug it down about, I'm guessing, eight to twelve inches. It, they had lowered that level of the floor to get you more bedroom in the basement. Now this picture here is. Prior to the removal of the baptism, because you can still see it up in there, part of that. But as we got working, we realized we, we did all the demolition and then realized that the deflection of that foundation wall along both sides, along both sides, over all these years, started pushing in, started pushing in on the bottom. So to correct that and make sure that it didn't progress any further, we poured a series of walls that went down all the whole length of the building, across here, around, and up through here. Now there's another picture here of more of the form work, because it was pretty extensive form work that we had. So because of them lowering that floor level, now that created a situation where there was nothing to stop or retain that bottom of that wall from working its way in. So along with that formwork, which gets difficult to see in this picture, we dug a trench down below the existing concrete floor so that after those forms were filled with concrete, it stopped it from pulling in. It hit the floor, now it's keyed in, and it's going nowhere. 
The wall is probably, it, it varies quite a bit because of the deflection of the wall. The concrete we poured down there when we had it pumped in, um, it's probably 8 to 12 inches thick with reinforcement rod every 12 inches within that. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's going to be there for a long time. <laughs> Try to do a really good job. So it's holding. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the main body of work that we did downstairs. Yeah, we reframed it. We put two modern 2x4s two up and things like that. We insulated it with spray foam, so all the walls have, have been spray foamed down there. One of the reasons why we use that, it seems to keep the mice out. I don't think we've ever had any real mice activity down there. I think it's been pretty, pretty good, and nobody's complaining about it. <laughs> so here's the, the vision of the basement is, is right there. But in our demolition, one of the things that we had to do, and I thought this was <laughs> this was was right where that table sits, right now, the table that she's sitting at, was the full immersion baptismal. Anybody here ever see that? Anybody ever see one? You've seen a full immersion baptismal? It was a jacuzzi. <laughs> it was huge. Now, right around here, um, and we've covered it up, but right around here, there was three or four steps, and then you would enter into this, and my, I can't remember the dimensions, probably about six by 10, maybe six feet by 10. You would come up three or four steps, and then you would you'd go into this pool. Now, my guess is, I'm not sure how warm that water was. <laughs> and again, these people were in gowns, full version, they're gonna get soaking wet. So you would go up that set of stairs, go down in there. I'm not sure if the minister was in the water with you. I doubt it. You went underwater. You went up another little set of stairs. And then back down into the basement, where my guess is you were met with somebody with hopefully towels, warm towels, and hopefully some dry clothes for you. I guess you need to be dedicated to being uh, Yeah, really to be happy. Get cleansed in such a manner. Now there's a picture of this little set of stairs going down, and it's, it's, it's funny just to think of what it would have been like to go through that ceremony and then come down this little flight of stairs that would be way over in that far corner. There's one more picture. Looked like they were having Sunday school. Uh, yeah, very dead. So that's a picture of the basement, and you can see a point here. That's cool. You can see right here. You can see right there where that level was changed. Here was probably approximately the first floor, and then they dug it down to that level there. So you can see where that step was. And then we created one that went way up, approximately four feet, and poured that full of concrete right in that area right there. Now, here's that little set of steps that came down through here. I could just picture somebody standing there shivering, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for their toes to get there. So that's, that's one of the things I, I thought was just kind of an amazing thing that, that went on. Okay, so. How did you get it out? How did you take out that full immersion practice? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it took a, at least a full day, the two of us. I had a gentleman named Kevin Malloy working at that time. That thing was built for good. It was two by sixes all laid flat, overlapping each other's in the corners, just solid wood. It was made out of uh, tin soldered joints and a drain in the bottom and some piping coming up. I'm not sure what they did for hot water. I'd like to know. But it was, in, it took us the whole day to get that thing out. I thought, oh, a couple hours, we'll be done. No, saws, all sledgehammers, crowbars, took us a while to get that thing out. Well, that bit been, by bit. Yeah, it carefully reinforced all that water. Absolutely. It was, it was meant to stay. Yeah. 
So, okay, now we've got the foundation built. Now we're framing. Okay, we've got all this framing up. As I said before, we got tonguing or uh, knocks out beams and the whole thing is all framed up. This has clapboard directly on the stud. This doesn't have any sheeting. You know, back then they wood was obviously hard to get here. They stretched it as far as they could. It didn't need sheeting. Years later, almost all buildings had sheeting and then the clapboards put on. My guess is, and it's unfortunate that this, this photo has, it looks like a fresh snowfall on it. Um, mainly there were two types of roof that were used mainly back then, the cedar shake. And they also had a stamped metal roof. It was like a stamped that little pattern, always kind of like an acorn pattern on them. You can still see evidence around town, old garages and stuff have it. I'm thinking that this probably had the metal roof. And the reasoning behind that is because if it was a cedar shape, the boards that you nail the shapes to are all perfectly evenly spaced so that the air could get behind and dry that shingle out. These were random width boards. Some boards were almost two feet wide up there. And so that kind of makes me think that it wasn't the cedar shape. Also, cedar shape roofs come on fire rate. That, that, that happened all the time. And a lot of these churches burned because of that. I mean, that was just a common thing in, in uh, local homes, too. So now we've got this whole place, it's all framed up. And we're starting to do, let's say, the heating and ventilation and stuff. Well, back then, what was heating? Stuff. Stuff. Coal stuff. One of the things that always amazed me as we were working here also, as you see those two little chimneys. See that one little shape there? See those two chimneys right there? Mm -hmm. It's hard to say, hard to see it now, we fill them in. But those are an extension of these columns. Both that column and that one over there are hollow. This one, somewhere is about halfway up had a penetration there for, my guess is a pipe for a coal stove. My guess it sat out somewhere in, out here in the middle. Downstairs there was another aperture for wood or coal stove down in the basement and that top. Those have now been removed. You can still see evidence of a level, level upstairs. But I go imagine those were the chimneys for the place. And because they were masonry chimneys, Probably one of the reasons why this building did not burn out. One of the ones that have stayed in the area. That, that's kind of an interesting little to me of architectural addition there. Okay, so now plumbing back then, my guess is they probably had a back house for people that had to travel or come here. Um, 1860s plumbing wasn't very sophisticated, it was a back house. Now we've got the whole place all framed up, and some of the work that we did, our framing, we changed, uh, well of course we reframed downstairs and a couple of modifications for the elevator, modifications for the bathroom and stuff like this, but hard to visualize things the way they used to be. When we came in here, we did a little bit of walking to her here, hopefully folks won't get a kink in your neck, look at if you can remember that this from here was not existing. That was just straight all the way up to the ceiling and same thing on the other side. You had your choir loft here and you can see where it started and stopped. We tried to mimic that that way the best we could. Um, looks like it could use a little more uh, shinier clear coat on there, but uh, <laughs> we'll get back to that. Okay. So anyways, we, this was non-existent and there was a set of stairs that kind of curved, very tight, small set of stairs, curved up and went into the choir loft up there. One of the things that we did was to modify the building, bring it up to today's date, is to install the handicap lift. Um, that's, I think that gets used 
quite a bit still, hopefully we will use it. Um, but they wanted the storage up here, and so we, we framed in those areas. Um, looks like it's packed full up there. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a good use of, good use of the space. So we built that big long wall. There's some pictures here too. Um, and I encourage everybody to take a look at some of these books full of pictures. Right? But you can see a little bit of the evidence of what it looked like before. And as we framed it, um, little different sized windows and things like that. So we built that. Now we're all framed up. Now it's time to put some plaster on the place. The vintage of this building dictates a, a plaster lath, wood lath. Now, older buildings than this would have a different type of lath. They would take a board about like this, maybe about three eighths of an inch thick, usually four feet wide, and they would take a, a hatchet and turn it like that. And it would split that board enough, it'd nail it, and that's where the plaster would fall into those cracks on the board and key into it. You can tell the buildings that are in town that are really old. They have that type of lath. This building has machined lath. It was run through a saw. It's all consistently about an inch and a half by three eighths. And that runs around the whole perimeter of this building. The spacing of it, the plaster falls into it. There's two, there, there's two coats of plaster. First coat is what they call a gray or brown coat. Um, today we call it perlite, but that then um, the binding ingredient in it was horse hair. Horse hair. What if it happened at the delivery? What they what they do? Shave the horses after the deliveries or what? But so had this put all the plaster, all of the lath on, and then the plasters would come. Well, one of the most interesting things about the architecture of this building itself here, and I haven't seen this in any other building in town. You have a very unique thing here. The molding that runs around the perimeter of this building, and it went all the way into there, all the way to the back and back, this way. It's fascinating. I had no idea what it, how they would possibly do that until we started doing the demolition. And that's when I noticed, wait a minute, there's impressions of plaster all around the whole perimeter, the whole building. You could see what they would do is they would build a form along the outside corner of the wall. They would take that form and it had different profiles and then they would make a profile, whatever they wanted, similar to that up there. And they would dump the plaster in the form and then screed it off so that it would produce that shape. And that, that's kind of, screening is an important word here because along with the plasters, they would do that around the windows. There'd be a little piece of wood that goes around the window to maintain that depth of plaster. And they would use that, what's called a screed edge. So around here, you've got all these pieces, all, the, all this plaster running around the whole primitive building. They screed it all off. During the process of going from the brown coat, there's two coats of plaster, brown or gray coat, then they would put a white plaster on top of that. But prior to doing that, they went up about as far as they had to. They, they knew where everything, you know, they knew how wide that was going to be. So that was fairly smooth up to there. And then behind those moldings, they, they would scratch it. They would crosshatch, take it right in the wet plaster. They would take a tool and crosshatch it, make it really rough, like all around wherever that was going to be. They do, do go in the gray plaster and make it real rough. Because then, after these formed pieces were, they would fracture them. And now, if you were to get up there real close, we we patched them all up and and sealed them all up. But if you look really close, about every four feet, there's a crack. About every four feet, all the way around the entire perimeter of this building. They would take these now fractured pieces and, and mud the back side with the white plaster and push them into that. And that's what 
was holding that up there. These, these small pieces. All the way around the whole perimeter, but including that. By the way, anybody that's sitting under that, that's only held up by four bolts. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been there long enough, I think we're okay with it. It's, it's going to stay. So anyways, then we decided that to make it look consistent, we didn't want to, we didn't want to ruin the looks of the place, we took and used a, a combination of PVC pipe and wood to come up with a, a, a mimic of that across the back, across that, that hole right there. That, I, I think that's one of the most significant things in this building. Um, I haven't been called on my notes at all here. So. So, do I have a question about the people who did the classrooms? Would they have been special crafts people who came in from somewhere else? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sure of that. I wish I had more time to research that. Yeah. There is a display at the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown about some of the technique of doing this. Hmm. And one of the one displays there. But yeah, that would have been a specialty thing. All the tools and the forming of it and things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and again, I wish I knew more I could answer that question better. Yeah. Are, there, are there any other questions? By the way, anybody? Any questions so far? Um, well, after all the plastering is done, now it's time to make the place look pretty. One of the things that my daughters and I came down one Sunday, and we had found after after we did some of the demolition up in the back, we had found the pattern, and then as you come in, the stenciling pattern that's in the entrance there mm -hmm. is an exact copy of what used to go around the whole perimeter of this building. We literally came on a Sunday with our onion skin, taped it on the wall, mm -hmm. cut it out with razor knives. And then went around the perimeter of the whole building, and it was very typical. I've seen this on a lot of other buildings similar to this in the area. It ran around the windows, and it ran, this had to be those, those lilies, and it ran around the windows and it ran around the base. That was just very typical of this type of a building. Um, literally, then I decided. We actually did that to my own home after copying it and, and doing that. We had it up. My wife got tired of it. We painted it over a couple of years ago. But uh, it, it, it does give it. I wish we had time. I'd love to redo that all the way around and make it look the way it used to be here. But that would take a, a lot of time and, and effort. Um, so anyways, uh, let's see here. Is there anything else? Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Did you have to do anything to the windows? Were they in pretty good shape or did you have to... The frames themselves were in quite good shape. However, I think every one of them has been restored by... Oh, do you remember the that? Yeah, the Yeah, gentleman there. Yeah, I, I worked with him at uh, St. George's in uh, Chadwick, too. Does it you know, comments about the windows? I'm sorry? Can I make some comments about the Please windows? do, please do. <clears throat> As some of you probably know, uh, I was president of the association back at that time. I worked with this wonderful craftsman every day for not that the work, I just came in. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what, what, what's the problem today? Well, we, we put the the socket here or over here, whatever. <laughs> Anyhow, we think that these state windows did not come in until the 1860s. Uh, you, you mentioned that about Yeah, that. there was a, yeah. That. And uh, I have, the, the, the Baptist lab, they left uh, some records, but no records specifically about the windows. But there were several stained glass window dealers, I mean, manufacturers in Utica at that time. So I think one of them probably did these windows. And they did raise some money in the 1860s, and so I think the windows were put in in the late 1860s, is my guess. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, we have this fellow in Chittenango. Ken, what's his name? Ken? Uh, Boy, it's a long time ago. Anyhow, he 
took you take one, he take one little bit of time in the studio and bring it back and put it in a mm -hmm. And the couple of the tops were just gray, uh, gray glass. The, the windows had been broken at some point. Do you know which ones they were? I think on that side. Yeah, at least there were two or three of these tops that were just a gray frosted glass, you know. But he, because if you notice, they're the same north and south. So he had the pattern. If this one was out, was this one was gray, that one there would be the one when he, he replicated it. So it was very easy for him, not easy, but I mean, he had a design. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to make up a new design. So I just thought you should be, be aware of that situation. But I enjoyed working with Dick White. It was a wonderful three or four years there. And we had a lot of, lot of fun and a lot of decisions to make, like what do you do with the, with the organ pipes over there? You know? What do you do with this? What do you do with the organ? What do you do with the, the pews? We had a lot of big decisions to make. So. We had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Who was it that donated the money for the windows? That was a, a one gentleman, right, that paid for the, the windows? Yeah, Henry Richard donated some money to us. Yeah. A big chunk. Yeah. About $47,000. Wow. And yeah, that took care of uh, chandelier, the, the windows themselves, and uh, maybe something else. Oh, I think it, oh, the lights, wasn't it? The, the bigger. Well, these lights are just school lights. They're, they're not, I mean, they were good, but they're not, right. not that expensive. But it, it, it goes back to the beginning of, of my talk here was the people. The enthusiasm, I'm sure that this enthusiasm that started this building back in 1830 carried on to 1860 where they decided, hey, we're, we're doing good now. Let's, let's put some more money into the building. And then that Enthusiasm, which is essential, is essential for us here today. People who step up to the administration, you know, that it's, it's a daunting task, I'm sure. And it's that enthusiasm which keeps these buildings going is what kept us such so motivated during this construction. It was such a pleasure to work here and working with all the people. Uh, and it was really nice going through these books the other day and seeing all the faces that that, that would come almost every day. It was, it was the the worst part about working here was when we had to move things, and then you see something that's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I worked by the hour, but I got I got to look at this for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that was the difficult part, the the, the interest in the place. Does that mean you owe us money? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you some time. <laughs> now, it was, again, it was very much a pleasure to, uh, to be here and work with all you folks. And, uh, I guess that's, that's pretty much what I have. Other than please ask questions. How much of the history of what is out here on the floor? I mean, were there the pews or whatever you want to call Oh, and everything was here. One of the things that, the, that the, was a feature of this place was the pitching floor. The floor used to pitch all the way there. And you can see, like back there, how some of the pew was notched into the top of the molding. And then as the pews progressed, they did not need to notch them so deep. So it was, it was one of the things about, there's another little bit of architecture, and I'm glad you reminded me of this. Part of the architecture of having a, a, a church with the doors, with, with, with a, instead of a center aisle, there would be pews in the center and, and way to come in on the right and the left, because it was thought that they didn't want to have the center door open up and have a devil, have the devil have a straight shot at the ministry. <laughs> it's fiery arrow. That is part of the architecture. Okay. And entrance coming. Wow. So, was there a pulpit? I'm not. I think there was a pulpit. I know there's a missile stand downstairs. That that book with their kind of book holder. I'm thinking that's been here all along. And that's a missile stand. And this probably is it right here. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And the chairs, the chairs back there are from the church. Who put it on wheels? Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Rose, you want to say something about the bookshelf? 
Oh, yeah. the um, the book, the third bookcase that's up. Well, you built the white book first, but just recently, um, last year, the year before last, I'm not sure, we asked why to build a third bookcase to match the first two that were built when the uh, building was first renovated, and you cannot tell one from the other. Um, it is beautiful. Um, so we appreciate white work today. Oh, by the way, we're waiting. Uh, <laughs> while you're here. <laughs> that's what I said. I a lot of that. He's so busy. You know how good he is because wow. he's so busy. It's, it's right like I said, the, the motivation is you folks. <laughs> that is really it. That, and it's the motivation for me to be here today. To, to say thank you for, you know, the he gave me an award 20 years ago for doing this, and I, I'm, I'm a paid guy. You know, I, I, the award should go to all you people that volunteered. Really. It's, uh, again, very much a pleasure to work here, and I do intend to continue. Um, I'll help with maintenance. I see the front door locks get a little loose. I'm going to pop over sometime this week and fix that for you. But, uh, Unless there's any more questions, I just want to say thank you for coming.